Welcome to the Christianity Then and Now presentation. In the beginning, there was the story of the life, death, and resurrection. According to the New Testament Gospels, Jesus was a good man, a teacher, a healer, somebody who uh, took care of and paid attention to the marginalized and downtrodden, and somebody who stood up against oppressive powers, be they religious or political. People hoped that Jesus was the Messiah that God had promised. Uh, but when he entered into Jerusalem, instead of liberating Judea from Roman oppression, he instead got into trouble, was arrested, brought before the local Roman governor, Pilate, and sentenced to death by crucifixion. This is an image of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The worshipers here are holding candles for a candlelight vigil as they prepare for the Easter celebration the next day. The place is where Jesus is said to have been laid to rest after his execution, after he was removed from the cross. And it's the place where women found the tomb empty when they came to dress the body on that Easter morning. So Jesus began appearing for a few weeks uh, to his followers and to others. But then, as the stories in the Gospel report, those appearances ended, and he was uh, taken up from their midst and no longer appearing to them physically. At the same time, those followers, as they waited for what to do next, knew that they had been promised something called the Holy Spirit, this divine force that would inspire them and move them to do what God had planned for them to do next. So in this presentation called Christianity Then and Now, we're going to first look at the then, and we're going to look at the event that started the Christian movement, and then we're going to go and track some of the key points and transitions in the history. This image is depicting the event of Pentecost, an event that Christians mark as the time that the Holy Spirit was sent to those early followers, about 120 of them, and that inspired them to speak the message of Jesus and to help others believe that Jesus was, despite being killed, the, pro the Messiah promised by God. Zooming in on it a bit more, you see above the Holy Spirit, symbolized by a dove, coming and visiting himself on these early followers of Jesus, like I said, inspiring them and emboldening them to tell the message of Jesus. And that's the idea of the beginning of the Christian movement, is that it begins with a mission, and the mission is to spread the good news, aka the gospel, around the world. Zooming in just a little bit further, you see that among the early followers here gathered and receiving the Holy Spirit are women. Um, as mentioned, women were present at the crucifixion and at the empty tomb, and uh, a, a core key part of the beginnings of the movement. And yet, the group of leaders, the circle of leaders, are known as the Twelve Disciples, and they are all men. Another key person in the beginning of the movement was the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul, who you can see down here, uh, was a Pharisee, a religious leader, who opposed Christianity. Uh, Paul was instrumental in having those earliest Jesus followers arrested and thrown into jail. But as the story in Acts chapter 9 tells it, uh, Paul was visited by the voice of Jesus, and he heard the voice tell him, uh, you better quit opposing me. Um, in fact, you're going to quit opposing me, and I'm going to give you a mission that you weren't planning on. So in this mission, uh, the missions, as you can see, uh, Paul spreads the word about Jesus throughout the uh, north eastern Mediterranean region, uh, beginning with a missionary journey, as it's called, that takes him out of Antioch into what's today the center of Turkey, where he plants some churches and synagogues. And then a little bit later, he takes a second missionary trip, that's the green line, and then a third missionary trip, that's the fourth line. And the last trip isn't really a missionary trip at all. He is arrested, and he's brought by boat all the way to the seat of power of the Roman Empire, Rome. And so that's how Christianity uh, gets Paul uh, as one of the first major leaders to end up in the city of Rome, where the Roman emperor also happened to live. 
So I've picked out a few Latin phrases to help understand the movements and the issues that were affecting and driving the early development of Christianity. Uh, this phrase, semen es sanguis Christianorum, is a phrase that means, check it, the blood of Christians is seed. This is an image of the interior of the Colosseum in Rome. The ancient Romans liked a little bit of blood sport, and one of the things they liked to do in terms of blood sport was to throw human beings to wild animals, including lions. And as Christianity grew and spread, they became to uh, appear as a threat to the Roman Empire and to the Caesars of the Roman Empire. So there were various persecutions during which many Christians were arrested and thrown into jail and even thrown into the Colosseum to die in some bloody way. This is an image of Perpetua and Felicitas, two women who were killed at the hands of the Romans around 200 AD. These two women are immortalized in a biography about them written by the early church leader Tertullian, who describes the manner in which these women died for the sake of the faith. Tertullian, the man who wrote the story of these brave women, was the one who said the blood of the martyrs is seed. And what he meant by that is as Rome brutalized Christians, uh, sympathy was created for Christians and their movement. And then upon sympathy, interest. And so as more and more martyrs came to the fore, more and more believers came to the fore as well. And the movement grew not despite of the fact it was being persecuted, but perhaps because of the fact it was being persecuted by the brutal powers of the Roman Empire. The next phrase, homo usian to patri, is not a Latin phrase at all. Here's the Latin version, consubstantialum patri. Maybe you know that phrase, consubstantiation. And this phrase means of one being with the Father. One of the things the early Christians had to settle was the question of Jesus's identity to the divine Father, the, the God of the Christians. During the centuries that they were being persecuted at the hands of the Roman Empire, internally Christians were discussing another matter altogether, and that was the question of, how is Jesus related to the Father? They sought consensus uh, regarding an answer to this question. Is Jesus a created being, so like a kind of demigod, uh, or is he God himself, but shoehorned into the form of a human being? Uh, the consensus view was Jesus and God are one, or Jesus and the Father are, are one, and the doctrine of the Holy Trinity was hammered out, and finally the consensus was reached in the early part of the 300s. All right, all right, our last Latin phrase is regnum et potestas et gloria, and that means the kingdom and the power and the glory, a phrase you might have heard at the end of the Lord's Prayer. This was a phrase that was attached to the Lord's Prayer as found in Matthew, attached uh, later after the New Testament period. This phrase, I think, uh, helps us evaluate what happened next in Christianity when it morphed from, from a persecuted religious movement uh, to the main religious movement and only allowed religious movement in the Roman Empire. It's uh, the transition from Christianity to Christendom. Remember that under the Roman Empire, Christianity was persecuted and many Christians died under various Roman emperors who sought to eliminate the movement. That all changed in the beginning of the 300s when a, a general named Constantine wanted to take over the city of Rome, and he prayed to the God above that he might be shown the right God to pray to. And so uh, as he went to sleep that night, he had a vision, and the vision was of uh, a cross, and he heard the divine voice say, in hoc signo vinces, a phrase that means, in this sign conquer. So the emperor uh, the next morning ordered his soldiers to draw the cross onto their shields and they were able to invade the city of Rome and Constantine became the new emperor. And his first act, one of his first acts was to declare that Christianity was legal in the empire. 
as an emperor, Constantine is a little complicated. Historians have questioned, is he a sincere Christian or is he co-opting Christianity? Because there are so many Christians in the empire, he wants Christians on his side. Uh, nevertheless, um, whatever may be the real nature of his faith, um, Constantine nevertheless was a military leader and a conqueror. And so here's an image of him um, uh, winning the victory in Rome that put him on the seat of the Roman Empire. What's interesting, though, is in a very short time, you know, within a hundred years, in a great example of I didn't see that coming, Christianity went from being a persecuted and illegal religion at the beginning of the 300s to being the only legal religion at the end of the 300s. And the emperor who made it the only legal religion is Theodosius the Great. So from the 300s forward, uh, Christianity's influence in the empire uh, began to grow. Um, however, at the same time, uh, the military might of the empire began to weaken and Rome experienced threats from without and uh, eventually Rome um, split up into smaller parts and was the end or the fall of the Roman Empire. But as the Roman Empire fell, the framework was in place for a new empire to rise, the Christian Empire, known as the Holy Roman Empire. In the year 610, the prophet Muhammad began receiving revelations, and by the end of the 600s, Islam had grown to be a military might on its own, uh, one that took territory that had been Christian. And so the stage was set for the Crusades, and this is an image of a movie about the Crusades called The Kingdom of Heaven. It was a bloody war that lasted uh, at least 150 years, having various stages, and uh, it showed Christianity at the height of its military power. Well, again, as empires do, the, uh, the empire began to weaken the Holy Roman Empire, the Christian Empire, and uh, weakened enough so that a monk in Wittenberg, Germany, could start a fuss. Uh, and because the empire was weak, and because the political situation meant that the church could not put down that monk, uh, the stage was set for what Christians call the Reformation, a time in the history of Christianity when the Western power went from being a uniform monolith to a a atomized group of various movements, starting with the Lutheran movement, and then the Reform movement, and then the Anglican movement, and then the Presbyterian movement, and subsequently all the other small subsets of what's called Protestant Christianity. So that was then. Let's talk about now, Christianity now. You're going to see some charts here uh, that kind of give the layout of what the Christian movement uh, has become, what it looks like. Uh, in the present century. So you can see that um, as far as um, how many Christians there are on the planet, we got 2.3 billion, and then right behind that, um, almost 2 billion Muslims, and then right behind that, uh, people who consider themselves uh, not religious, uh, 1.2 billion. Uh, so here's the pie chart. Uh, so Christianity has grown from 120 people to one way or another, uh, 200, uh, 2 billion people who uh, some way or another are connected with Christianity. Uh, in this chart, you see how the Christians of the world are split up. Fully half uh, find their authority under the Roman Catholic Church um, and identify with churches that are under the authority of the Pope in Rome. Uh, you see on this pie slice, a group of Christians known as Eastern Orthodox Christians uh, mostly centered in Russia and Turkey and Greece and Egypt. Um, and then the one that people in the U.S. are most familiar with, perhaps, uh, because it grew uh, to become so large in the U.S., is Protestant Christianity. Uh, and that's a common umbrella term for all the smaller brands of Christianity, like Lutheran, Catholic, Presbyterian, Baptist, and so forth. Uh, here's how Christians are distributed throughout the world, but uh, it's worth saying a, a word about this number. Um, it says half a billion Christians live in Europe. Uh, however, a lot of those Christians should be considered nominal Christians. These would be Christians who were raised in a Christian culture. Perhaps they were baptized as babies. 
um, but uh, do not practice um, or even believe Christianity as adults. Here's a, a picture of the inside of Joel Osteen's church. Here's Joel here. Uh, we discussed Joel earlier in the class, and that's him on the big screen. He's way down here uh, giving his message at the front of this former basketball arena in Houston. This is a large church, so you would think looking at it that, wow, Christianity is doing really, really well. If they can gather this many of them in one arena in the city of Houston. Uh, but the fact is that um, the number of people who report themselves or identify themselves as non-religious is going up in the country. And we have uh, what we call nun zones uh, in various parts of the country. People who, when asked, what is your religion? They answer none. Um, so you see that in Washington, almost 50%, in Oregon, almost 50%, Alaska, almost 50% say I'm not religious when the pollsters ask them. And uh, it's even more in the Northeast, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, uh, where more than 50% of people say I'm not religious. So as a number of people who report as non-religious or identify as non-religious goes up, uh, the number of people who identify as Christian in this country goes down. Uh, how do these nuns identify? <clears throat> Um, you can see the percent change uh, over time, um, but not all of them who say I'm not religious are atheist or agnostic. Um, it seems that uh, many of them are just not interested in organized religion um, or do not find religion very important. Um, but it's very possible that many of these people who call themselves nuns uh, believe in the supernatural, believe in God, perhaps even believe that Jesus is the son of God. So it's possible that they are religiously unaffiliated um, because they're not interested in organized religion. Again, people who break down the numbers of increasing nuns, religious nuns, uh, are looking at it in terms of age. And you can see here that the number of people who are unaffiliated goes up the younger they are. So people who were born between 1928 and 1945, um, they're pretty Christian here. If you look, this is how many of them uh, identify as Christian, um, more than 80 percent. But if you go to the young millennials, those born in 1990 to 1996, um, you can see that the number of Christians across the board goes down considerably. And so the people who identify as non-religious is actually the biggest religious group. So the question is, with uh, Christianity in decline in the United States, um, of course, that's something some people uh, consider a blessing, uh, but Christians themselves, uh, not so much. And so the question is being asked, um, what about the future? Wither Christianity, that is, is it going somewhere? Where is it going? And that's a discussion for another time. Thank you for listening.